Okay, so um, one, so some people have said that there's actually a kind of crisis of imagination, and that sounds maybe a bit sort of over the top, perhaps that you know that there could be a crisis in some. So if you think about this, what what would it actually mean for there to be a crisis in in imagination? It, it means, in some sense, that we're, um, you know, that we're either unable to imagine how things could be different, or that the things we are imagining perhaps cause problems or are leading us down a particular route. And some people have said, for example, you know, I mean, this is a, a few years old now, but th th actually the reality that we're living in now is essentially made up of kind of conf conflicting in some ways or competing um, forms of imagination or, or, or fictions in, in the way J.G. Ballard um, described it. And others have said, you know, for example, this quote, you probably, you probably know, I'm not sure who actually said it originally, whether it was Frederick Jameson or... Zizek, that this, this idea that you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than, than to imagine the end of capitalism is an interesting idea, right? Whether or not you agree with that, there's something there about the question of how do we, you know, what can we imagine or what kind of alternatives could we imagine? You know, and others have said that, you know, for example, that it's, it's actually not that much of a problem and that actually if we pay attention to what's, you know, what people are thinking and if we enable people to think in different ways, that this other world can be possible. And in fact, that it's, you know, not, not only possible, but it's, you know, it's potentially on its, on its way. Um, now, what this comes down to is this question of kind of imaginaries as a concept. Now, it's something from sociology um, originally... Um, and deals with both now and um, and the future in in lots of ways. Um, sorry, thanks. Yes. Um, um, and imaginaries as a sociological concept are sort of around. They're often described as you know they're kind of around like society's ways of thinking about topics or society's ways of of dealing with um, with with topics or imagining these things. And it's sort of these questions almost of like how do people imagine the future on one level, what's possible, what's likely, what's changeable. And that's everything at the kind of personal level, societal level, at an ecological level, but also how people imagine and make sense of things that are not necessarily in the future, but are, are things right now that are, um, you know, that are big or complex or invisible or maybe very small or maybe just out of, out of our scope of, of understanding them. And the way people often deal with these things is, is through stuff like metaphors or folk theories or, or, or stories um, music, art, and, and culture are essentially all about this, these, these ways for people to engage with these things that are bigger than themselves or, or are too difficult to, um, to, to deal with. And so on some level there's this... Um, sorry. Um, on some level there's this idea that, that, you know, perhaps we find it so difficult to deal with some of these big topics like, like climate crisis or, or you know, um, kind of pandemics and, and, and kind of health and inequality because our narratives, our understandings of ourselves and the systems we're in are kind of limited by enormity or, or complexity or invisibility. Um, in some way, we're kind of trapped in particular understandings or ways of imagining how things could be. And part of that is that perhaps there's been too much of a focus, maybe, on, on individual behaviour change rather than sort of systemic or infrastructural issues and, and kind of power structures. One way of looking at this also, it's, it's not just, imaginaries are not just about how do we imagine the future or how do we imagine complex things, but there's also this idea that in some way they could help us deal better with the uncertainty or unknown things or things that haven't, haven't occurred yet, right? So you think about this Jenny Holzer quote, the, the, we live the surprise, you know, you live the surprise results of old plans. And that's essentially about thinking through, you know, the consequences of these things. It's not just about how could the future be, but also unintended consequences or things we can't quite imagine yet or side effects. And people have said things like, for example, you know, perhaps a good science fiction story is not about you know, imagining the car, but more about imagining traffic jams. Right? And so what, what happens if you think about that idea? When we think about transitions or we think about any of these big changes, it's not, clearly not going to be a kind of linear process where, as designers might often be approached to do, you know, there's a problem and you solve it, even though obviously that's not really how things are, as I'm sure Terry will talk about in a, in a bit. Um, but there's this idea that kind of, you know, thinking through these, these side effects can be a way of, like design can kind of enable us to effectively rehearse the future in some way. So to actually experience perhaps what the different consequences could be of different ideas, how society might change, how everyday lives might change. And perhaps research, rehearse futures rather than just the future. And so, for example, I've got a student at the moment um, at, at TU Eindhoven, uh, Rosemarine Over, who's, who's uh, looking at kind of the idea that what would people's first encounter be with 
um, well, in, in her project, essentially imagine that governments actually did something about, about climate change. How would that be explained to the public and what would the first stage be of that? So you're engaged with it by perhaps receiving a letter in her, in her project. Certain people will receive a letter telling them that their local government, city government, is making these changes. Things like, for example, they're going to um, you know, uh, heavily tax certain things, they're going to give incentives to others. What is it like if you, at that moment of experiencing that change, and it, she's telling them that they've been selected because they're already pioneers in some way, so that they're kind of part of this vanguard. What do they do? How do they deal with that? How do they convince other people? How do they, what, what do they question? What do they not? And so on. So this in some ways is like an attempt to sort of rehearse a possible future in, a, in an experiential way. Um, now in sociology, imaginaries are often thought of this kind of, um, you know, in a theoretical sense, they're often this sort of kind of conflation of how people kind of deal with things that they observe in the world. How do they make sense of them? How do they relate them to principles that you might believe you have or values you might have? And so sociologists often think about imaginaries as being both about the present and about the future in this way. But there's also this idea of a kind of how things should work, which I think is quite interesting. So there's, it's not just about what, what, what might happen, but also what should happen and what do people think about that. And some of this is based on this idea that kind of if, you know, um, if people define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. You know, if you, if you believe that you know, Corona, for example, was, you know, was a government conspiracy or a you know, Bill Gates conspiracy or whatever it was, whether or not that's true, if you act I as if that's true, then your life is just the same as if it was a, a, con a government conspiracy, perhaps, and you were, and you were, uh, you were trying to avoid it. So there's something, I think there's something interesting there. Now this is a project that um, just, uh, just started in collaboration with some partners in, in Norway and, and the UK called Imagine that, um, that is about exploring what some of these sort of dominant imaginaries are, if you like, of particular types of sustainable futures around, around different topics. And also what's contested, like what things are not agreed on. So, you know, there's lots of images, Hollywood images of flying cars and people living on Mars and all of this, but clearly those are contested. They're not, it's not that everyone thinks that's inevitably the future. So how are they contested and where, how might it be possible to, to in, introduce a more kind of participatory form of contesting those, those features? So when we think about transitions, we might think, well, how does imagination relate to them? And how does it relate to just transitions as well? So how do we, how do, we do transitions that actually you know, are, have a degree of social justice to them or, or are fair, rather than it being something perhaps um, you know, imposed top down in, in, in a way by governments or, or designers? I mean, I'm sure Terry's going to talk about this in much more detail, but I, I've tried to think about how, um, well, together with my um, former colleague Stuart Candy, I've tried to think about how imagination and visions relate to the transition design framework. And I, I won't talk all this through in detail, but there are, there are elements of kind of, you know, imaginaries of different futures could be co-created visions of, of futures, but they could also be sort of understanding these kind of tacit, unspoken imaginaries that people maybe have at present about, about what's going to change, what could change, how their lives could be, and so on, how change happens. So imaginaries can be mindsets, they can be related to worldviews, and I think also as, you know, in the design process, like there are almost things that you can use as designers to help people explore things, to help people think about things, to understand what people are doing and, and what they would think and how they would react. Um, and so, I mean, Stuart and I wrote about this a few years ago, tried to start exploring this subject. But I think having, um, having worked on this since, I think I, I would sort of look at it in this way, like how can design methods, like this is what designers can do in this, in this domain, it's sort of like, how, does, how can design methods help people imagine, explore, and experience different futures for themselves and society more widely? Now, that's very broad as a question, but, you know, as designers, you know that you've got certain methods that you can use. You know there's ways of engaging people or getting people to sort of provoke, to provoke people in different ways or to synthesise information in different forms and so on. And what perhaps this comes down to is that maybe we need more public imagination or maybe we need more public or more, more participatory imagination perhaps or even more collective imagination. Um, you know, there isn't that much of that. You see it in some planning processes for cities, but w where else do we really see this in everyday life? I mean, it's, it's present in some kind of open source projects and peer created things and obviously I suppose within like for example like transition towns and the sort of transition movement but it's not a common thing for there to be like public imagination as a, as a big force in society but perhaps it could be because often the images of the future that we see are you know there I mean this actually looks quite appealing but this is from a 1960s um, uh, artwork for Motorola but 
you know, they're often seen as a singular future versus this idea of more plural futures or, or different, which may all be true at the same time, right? In the same way as if someone said to you, well, you know, describe contemporary society, right? There isn't clearly any one description that would fit it. And so even our world at present is, is a very different set of presents for obviously people in different countries, different cultures, but even within the same, I mean, even the same room, right? Everyone here has got a different conception of what the present is like and what you're hopeful about, what you're not, what's going well, what, what isn't. So the idea that we would have these kind of singular visions of futures is sort of kind of nonsense, really. And I think we should remember that. Um, and, of course, it may be that communities that perhaps haven't been previously very much involved in being, even being listened to by people who are making decisions about things. Like, for example, this is a, some work on kind of Afrofuturism with, with, with teenage girls in, in, um, in the US, which I think is quite interesting about building models of what a future city might be from people who would otherwise never be involved in that process, right, or would never be invited to. Um, and, you know, even today, this is just something I saw earlier this morning, like, the, the, the in a sense, when you think about climate, like, the climate futures are here for many people in the world already, right? So us talking about well, what will the future be like when, you know, as the climate changes, for many people it's already, it's already present, so it's possible almost to see, in this case, this is a huge rubbish pile fire in, in Delhi during a heat wave. Like, is in some senses, we're already people, some people are already experiencing these features, and I think we can learn from them. So you know this quote, I'm sure you've probably seen you know, hundreds of times, this idea that the future's already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. But there are ways of thinking about this beyond this, just this sort of singular future. And one of them is, is looking and seeing almost like the present as a sort of mishmash, a kind of textured form of past and present and possible futures all at once which I think is quite interesting. You know, as a design exercise, this, people really enjoy this, right? Sort of analysing, you know, what will still be, what in, what in this room will still be here in 50 years? What was, still, what was here 50 years ago? How are they different? What do you think you would have differently with you? Um, but there's also this idea that, like, what bits of our futures are other people already living and can we learn from them? And, and as part of transition, I guess that relates to ideas perhaps like sort of cosmopolitan localism and so on, where you sort of, um, within, within the kind of more theoretical approach to it, but even things like looking at how climate change is illustrated, there's some really good projects like Climate, climate Visuals, for example, that tries to find better illustrations for, um, for, for climate change, for, for, you know, for journalists, so that it's not always the same few pictures of, um, in, at least until recently, often a picture of you know, an iceberg. Um, and I think this is important. So these kind of popular images of what people think, how people imagine, or how, how the media presents different futures or different concepts is important because it affects how we think about them. You know, this is what AI looks like from, you know, from Google, Google Images' perspective. You know, these images shape what people think that is, right? It's blue for some reason, I don't know. Um, but if we think about even about, the, the, um, even about the next one, like the future cities, you know, future cities are presented, at least in kind of popular imagery, as being... I mean, at least many of them are green. They're very grey, but they're also very green, I guess. But there's no people in any of them. There's no old buildings. There's no marketplaces. There's no, you know, everything's planned, centrally planned. Whereas we know this is not what reality's like. Um, I think this is a really interesting experiment. Um, I, I think this is the start of something quite intriguing. So this is something from, um, from Danielle Baskin, who's a researcher who does lots of design and AI and so on. And she's got to the position of being able to generate using kind of, um, in this case, DALI, which is like a sort of AI image generator, alternative pasts, if you like, for San Francisco where there was public transport dominated, right? So to create realistic images of trains on the Golden Gate Bridge and, you know, as if they really existed and, and so it's an alternate past and presenting that as if, you know, it's like a fictional narrative about the present. I think it's really interesting. This sort of thing is now becoming much easier for people to do. And imagine doing this on a huge scale where people could create alternative versions of their own, where they live, how, how the past was perhaps as well as, as how the future could be. I think there's a lot of potential there as a, as a form of kind of public imagination or, or a method for doing it. And obviously designers are very well placed to do that, right? Um, there's also practic practically there are projects like some of these things from... Um, these are some projects funded or put together in a portfolio by uh, Cassie Robinson, who's very interested in, in, in this area. It'd be worth looking at her work if you're interested in this kind of participatory imagination, where um, this is in the UK. Essentially, the uh, National Lottery Community Fund funded 52 projects. This is quite a lot. 
very small projects mostly, of community groups essentially to reimagine something about their future for their, for their community using lots of different methods, some of them very specific, some of them much more broad. But this idea of kind of situated, participatory, public reimagining of places and, and lives I think is interesting. And it's again, it's something that designers are really well placed to, to, to address and to work on. And it's something that transition design, you know, I think needs, right? Because it's, the visions are so important for it. So there are some other good, there's some good projects going on like this at, at present in different places. So this is a couple of friends of mine in, in Brussels who are doing this um, at Brussels Avenue where, where they're essentially working mostly with young people but also older people, refugees, people from different backgrounds on you know, what, what could Brussels be like in, in the future. A huge number of different visions around different topics from music and even what, you, what would you hear to, um, to transport and, and so on. So they've done things like you know, creating stories that are set on a tram in, in the future with people talking to each other from different backgrounds and, and so on. Which, so it's, it's design, but it's also kind of narrative and storytelling and, and so on. So if we come back to the transition design um, framework again, so you can see that this sort of, these co-created visions, there's lots of ways that this can be, that this can be addressed, I think, and designers are very, very well placed to help, help people co-create these visions. So I work in a group in, in Eindhoven called, um, called Future Every Day. But I also, um, also run something called the Imaginaries Lab that um, originally started at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so th thank you to Terry for helping with, with the initiation of that. But what we really do is, is we try and sort of use design or create design tools, I suppose, to help understand how people understand and imagine and kind of help people understand and imagine in new ways. Um, but also to help people imagine new ways of living. And I think that's kind of, you know, that's something that, that has, a more, um, has a more kind of practical dimension maybe, like how could everyday life be different? And one of the ways of doing that is by getting, trying to get these sort of imaginaries out of people's heads and into a shared space together. And, um, you know, because this idea that sort of when thought, I mean, I mean this is much more kind of a, a psychological perspective that when thought overwhelms the mind, people put it into the world. But it's really interesting seeing how going from kind of, you know, a sort of more text-based description of futures and possibilities to something where people actually either draw things or make models or, or, or you know, together in a group, making these kind of imaginaries more tangible, I think is, is so effective as, as in people understanding each other's point of view and, and, um, and so on. So I think it's quite a powerful thing to do. So a lot of the projects that we've done really are about this sort of idea of like making imaginaries tangible in some form. And it's not always about futures. So this, this work, um, which was originally in initiated by Delaney Ricketts um, at Carnegie Mellon, was around, um, well, it is around kind of using landscape metaphors. So building model landscapes, very stylized, with things like hills and bridges and roads and decisions, like junctions and things like that, road junctions, to try to sort of envision, I don't know, either to tell, to tell a story about something or to envision your own future, perhaps, as a group. Um, so some of it's been around, you know, collectively, like this was a group looking at like the future of humanity, trying to build like a landscape of what, what that could look like. And obviously there's no right answer or wrong answer. It's more around the discussion that it prompts, you know. What are the challenges that you see ahead of you versus what someone else might see? There's also personal futuring as well. So this is some students at Eindhoven who've been working on this, um, where people build, are building models essentially of their own future, like what they see are the challenges are going to be for them or or where they're going to have, where they th what choices they think they're going to have to make or be able to make in the future. Um, and again, you know, it produces things that maybe don't make much sense if you look at them afterwards, but the process very often is the point because the discussion that it causes or the reflection that it enables is, is, is important. Um, so there's lots of variants of this sort of approach with different, um, yeah, which, you know, can lead to different forms of sort of imagination. But we've also done some work on applying these kind of methods to interdisciplinarity, like people looking at each other's perspectives and seeing, okay, how do I understand your worldview? Or can we together build something that, that represents multiple worldviews? Um, and so though this partly in different forms has led to this, which is a new project um, in collaboration with some really interesting people in, in the Netherlands, funded by a, a great place called the Centre for Unusual Collaborations, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a good, good title as well. But we're trying to look at kind of some of the methods from sort of games and play as ways of helping people understand each other's worldview in an inter interdisciplinary sense. Like, can you kind of 
can you use methods of play or in some cases things that designers might do anyway really these sort of these sort of more practical facilitation methods to get researchers from you know environmental science or politics or, or um, food governance or all these different topics to um, to uh, work together um, you know to un at least understand each other's points of view and, and see what they've got in common perhaps um, so I thought okay, um, so yeah and so we've been looking at that at present and I think this could develop into some quite interesting quite interesting things. Um, there's also a lot of other work around this sort of making things tangible, like other invisible things, so other concepts that are perhaps difficult to put into words. So we've done quite a lot of work on mental health and people perhaps finding ways to share, often through building models or, or some other form of kind of construction, like things that are really difficult to put into words, emotions that maybe are, you know, it's not easy to describe to someone else, but perhaps if you can build something that represents how you feel, you can discuss it in a different way. And all of this leads to, and this is what partly the workshop tomorrow will, will be about or will involve, this, this sort of idea of, of creating new metaphors for, um, for, for different futures, for thinking about futures in different ways or for reframing things. Because often when we, um, well, so, this is, so this is a kit which I'll show you tomorrow if you come to the workshop, but which is sort of a, a card deck for generating different metaphors around things and sort of thinking them through in creative ways. Um, but the reason for this is, um, well, actually, I'll come back to that in a, in a second, near the end. But, but there's also this dimension, I guess, with, with some of the work of this idea of perhaps more qualitative approaches to, um, to, to some of the things that at present we might think of mainly in terms of quantitative data. So a lot of these invisible systems, and I've done quite a lot of work on energy in the past and like how people understand energy and, and these sort of concepts. Um, the quantification, the sort of default quantification of, of a lot of these things perhaps doesn't necessarily always help people understand them in a, in a way that maybe, uh, maybe it almost in some ways alienates some of the systems from, from us. If you talk about climate change only in terms of, you know, the rise in, in average rise in degrees Celsius, that doesn't give us an experiential sense of what that feels like, right? It's not just going to be that it's a little bit warm, but it's that they're going to be more extremes, perhaps, right? Or that the feeling is going to be different, or that the the sort of qualitative experience is going to be different to now. And I think that doing work around this, or like valuing the qualitative, I, I, I feel is quite important in transition design. It's perhaps not obvious, but but I think it's part of this sort of experiential focus. So so those actually on, they were on screen before were like were uh, it was around showing energy use in a more in audio, but also through vibrations and light, right? In you know it's in real, real time, or some of it was. So it's you know it's it does quantify it in a sense, but not through numbers. One of my PhD um, students in the US at, at present, um, Megan Urban, is looking at, for example, using trees or using the sound that trees themselves make. Um, as a way to, um, so recordings of you know, the sounds that trees make as the wind blows, you know, moves them or they crack over time, as a way to help people almost experience longer time durations or at least be aware of these kind of much longer time scales. So it's a sort of qualitative interface for a tree, if you like, um, although she doesn't call it that, but I guess that sort of is. And so we're actually with some colleagues we have at, at this big design research um, conference next month, we've got a whole track about these sort of things, these much more qualitative, non-numerical non sort of ways of, of doing interaction design. Um, and also I should mention this, which may, again may seem a long way from transition, but this work on sort of spooky technologies or technologies which in some way feel people feel scary, uh, they feel, uh, scary or um, in some way haunted perhaps, which can be everything from, you know, smart homes to um, to you know AI to just systems you don't understand right these bigger systems like you know how does how does the internet work how does how do these things even work and, and are they effectively are they something we're scared of um, so this is a book that did with um, some of my students and a, and a colleague at, a former colleague from Carnegie Mellon that's that we've just released earlier this year but what it also the dimension that I think is particularly related to, to transition design in futures, which we'll talk about tomorrow in the workshop, is this idea of sort of hauntology, like which, which ideas effectively or which visions of futures haunt us now, like which previous visions still affect us right now, even though, even though perhaps they're not, they're not actually real, right? And that could be everything from, you know, I don't know, imagining that by now we should be living on the moon or something, or by now society should be perfect, or, or these sort of ideas that, that kind of affect us even though they never came true. And what are the things we're creating now that are going to haunt us in the future? Which I, you know, I think is, is particularly relevant in the transition sense. So some of the practical projects with students, and this is why I think a lot of these are with, 
working with students, which I think is partly why the sort of education focus of this, of this event is quite interesting, because a lot of it comes through that. Um, then various projects with students trying to sort of bring to life bits of different climate futures in, in the present. So this was, a, this was a group of students who, uh, they couldn't actually get any fax machines because they're now really expensive. So actually they, they used sort of printers, network printers instead, where people could, um, from different generations, could send each other messages about trying to explain their point of view. What is it, what do, what do I, so what does a teenager looking at the future feel about the future compared to, um, compared to what an older person might do, for example, and how does that differ? And so they would annotate each other's comments or images or drawings and then fax them back to each other, back and forth. So you ended up with kind of very degraded sort of set of annotations. Whether or not it's useful, I don't know, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting approach to trying to ch create a conversation. Um, you know, different forms of this is a game around kind of almost challenging yourself to live with fewer clothes and to make them last much longer. Um, and so there's some idea here, there's actually the thing you see on the screen now is about uh, um, training people to, um, to be able to detect different air pollutants. So maybe you could actually learn to detect them yourself, or at least when, when the combinations of them on particular days, when maybe a heat wave means that, you know, there's certain, certain, sm certain pollutants become much more, um, you know, much more tangible maybe. But part of this is about trying to imagine these things at scale, so actually being able to perhaps live in these possible futures temporarily. And so this idea of experiential futures that Stuart Candy has developed a lot, I think, is, is important here. Um, and so some of my students at present are looking at almost trying to combine like a kind of autoethnographic approach where you sort of study your own reactions to things or your own experience with this sort of experiential futures. So I've got a group who are living, trying to live in a way where they share as many like household objects as possible. So everything that isn't, you know, doesn't get really dirty if you, um, you know, doesn't need cleaning so regularly, can you share it? Can you share a toaster or a microwave or a cooker? What does that mean? Does it mean you negotiate with each other to go around each other's houses? Does it mean that you have to have a rotor? What does it, what does it mean? Right? What would that look like if we, if we live with fewer possessions? There's also another group looking at time as well. What happens if we just disregarded the exact time for much of the day and only, only paid attention um, at certain times? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so there's also um, some of these other methods around kind of more participatory forms of featuring. I mean, this is some work that Tamar C. Wolfson and I did around like using methods from screenwriting as a kind of way to get people to almost like imagine different futures together because, you know, most people, maybe the design methods are not so familiar, but, you know, most people have watched movies and so there are certain tropes, if you like, that you can use to establish, to kind of do world building and, and so on that, that are actually quite creative. Um, and some of the most interesting work I think at present I've seen around participatory futuring in this sort of way, like using these creative writing or even like improv techniques, is um, some work by uh, Yuli Sikorska, in, who's based in Berlin, um, who's looking at essentially what happens if, um, if there's, um, if there's uh, in, a, in a city where there's, well in Berlin itself, in a particular area of Berlin, where future heat waves perhaps mean that, you know, perhaps many people die, but also what happens if a city reacts well to it? What happens if a city learns from it? So Berlin in 20, 2039 perhaps has dealt with, you know, maybe it didn't deal with the first big heat wave very well, but perhaps it deals with the next one better. And what does that look like? So uli has been doing this work, um, which I did a small part, where I was participated in a small amount, around this sort of idea of how do people adapt w when they look back on what happened, what do they wish they'd done differently, what have they learned from it, how has the city reacted and so on. So this is really, if you have a, the website, it's very, very interesting, it's got things like sort of a report from that future about how the city dealt with it and co-created stories from, from members of the public, from different participants around, um, around like how they imagine they would live in, in that world and what would be different, what jobs exist, what things are people selling, even so these, these photos on the, um, and these were like um, just these are things that people created, like you know, sort of adverts for stuff they imagine would be for sale in, in twenty thirty nine, and, and what jobs there would exist, and so on. Um, so, and we also, as part of this, for example, did like a conference from the future. So it was as if there was a conference in twenty thirty nine on heat resilient cities, where people talked about what their cities were doing and how successful it had been. And obviously, it's not right or wrong, but it's a way of kind of prefiguratively thinking about sort of. How did transition? How are transitions happening? Perhaps in a, in a practical sense. Um, so, I'll just finish a little bit with, with. I'll come back to the to metaphors essentially. So, I 
I worked quite a lot on sort of design for sustainable behaviour. Like, how, do, how can you influence people's behaviour through design so they use, you know, they perhaps they use less energy or generate less waste and so on. And I, while I think actually behaviour is the wrong framing, I think this is a much too top-down sort of approach. Now, like, going through the process of, of it, I think I learned quite a lot about how, how, how design does affect what people do and, and think and so on. And so this was like this kind of card deck on... on um, you know, how do different things influence what people do and how might you use them in, in, in a way to, to sort of influence more sustainable or other, other different ways of um, behaving. But it, what it led, the route that it led to was looking at energy use and how, um, you know, and how do people use energy in different, um, in different ways, how do they understand what's going on. And so through various projects with, you know, different groups and um, looking at visualising energy in different ways or, or helping people understand it in everyday life in different ways. Like, how do people in living labs and in people's own homes, how do people understand feedback and, and all the and numbers and so on? What it led me to, essentially, was that the invisibility of this thing is a major issue in people understanding it or not understanding it. Because, like many, many topics, like even like climate change, it's not something you can just point to as an object and say, there it is, that's how much of it there is, that's what, that's what its qualities are, or... So on. And so often people's mental models and their mental imagery became really important in how they thought about it. And so my colleague Flora Bowden and I did a lot of work on things like getting people to draw what they thought energy looked like, right? which is very easy to do, but you learn a huge amount about people's understanding of this abstract concept, what they think is going on, what, the, what, what they think, um, you know, children, adults, what have they learned, where have they learned it from, what, you know, what, what sort of preconceptions do they have? Um, and... I mean, there's a book from it, which is, you know, is, is very, quite visually interesting. And we tried different approaches, like turning it into sound, you know, what if you could hear it, and, and so on. But what a lot of it came down to, practically, is that the metaphors people use for understanding invisible things, or big concepts, or small concepts, or basically invisible concepts in general, metaphors are really important because they affect how you think about things. They affect what you think is true or false, and what you do, and what you plan to do, or the limits or the scope of what you do. So... This is just the last few, last few slides now, but like, when you think about sort of the plurality of possible futures, you know, do you see the future, whether that's you know, in a transition sense or otherwise, as being sort of you know, these things that are hidden, shrouded in mist from ours, or is it actually more like the road ahead and perhaps your job maybe is to be the warning sign, maybe about you know, warning humanity of the dangerous bend, maybe? I don't know. Um, do you see futures as more about... Um, uh, so more about like a, um, a signpost where there's lots of possibilities and, you know, are you the signpost as a designer? Like, are you kind of showing people which ways, which things you could do? Is it more about a conversation, perhaps? You know, are futures more just an endless conversation? Are they a mosaic of different ways of doing things that all exist simultaneously? Uh, you know, is it more about things growing on things and kind of, you know, sort of building on it? There's no wrong answer, right? There's no right or wrong answer to any of these, but it's clear that if you thought about the future or futures in each of these different metaphors, it would probably lead you to address it in a slightly different way. You know, if you see that, if you see futures as being this, like things growing on things, then maybe you prioritise sort of building things for other people to build on. You, cr you prioritise creating infrastructure or, or, or sort of, you know, almost like facilitating imagination. Whereas if you saw it more as like, you know, signpost perhaps, and there's only, you know, certain options and we need to pick, need to pick them. Um, and so I think that, you know, this approach of kind of generating new metaphors for, for things, even just as a process of rethinking them, or just thinking through what could the consequences be, or how could we imagine things differently, I think is, is quite a valuable approach. And so this is partly what we'll do in the workshop tomorrow, although we'll do, do some other things as well. Um, it's really just a way of kind of expanding our conceptual vocabulary. Um, so, finally, applying all of this to designing kind of more just transitions, I think, so if we go back to this, I mean, I, I keep going back to this diagram, but if we remind ourselves again of the different, different aspects of this, I think one step is to get imaginaries out of people's heads and into a shared kind of space, so you can understand what each other's thinking and how each other's imagining. I think you can look for parts of futures in the now, like who is doing things that maybe seem unusual now but in a few years time many people will be doing right or many people should be doing perhaps or maybe futures that never come to pass things that are just not gonna they can't we can't allow this this trend to you know if, th if this continues things are going to get worse noticing those possible things in the, in the, in the now I think is a big part of it 
making imaginaries tangible and experiential and rehearsable even is, a, is, is important. Uh, you know, any of these transitions, if there's a way we can kind of preemptively ex experience some of them, some of what, what, what happens, then I think that gives us a much better grasp on, on what maybe we would want to happen or what we wouldn't. I think always be aware of like whose imaginaries are present and whose are not, like who's included and who isn't, and can you, you know, is it about including people or is it actually about them creating it themselves, you know, because uh, an approach that is only kind of, well, we should, you know, we should invite some people who aren't represented, perhaps is not, you know, that itself demonstrates a power structure, right? So I think there's, there's it's an important question to bear in mind. And there are a couple of really interesting projects you probably know about, some of you probably know about these things, but like Untitled, for example, is worth having a look at. It's a program of talks and events and workshops looking at, I guess, experiments with different futures, I suppose. And also the Plurality University Network has a regular series of like talks and, and online events around sort of more plural futures, often people from Global South, speculative fiction writers and so on, as well as designers. So quite interesting approach. And um, yeah, if you're going to come to workshop tomorrow, please bring a laptop. I forgot to, I forgot to ask that. And uh, um, yeah, so thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I went over time in a couple of minutes, but thank you everyone. And do we have any questions here or comments on John? Okay, Alma, Alma is having a question. Um, well, I don't know how much this is a question, but I like everything else that we do, there is a difference between participation and engagement, mm. and then engagement at last or leads mm. to action. So I was wondering if in um, uh, applying these different methods to prompt mm. people to think about futures, do you notice that some of them work better to actually activate towards some concrete action uh, rather than the others? And what are they? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think if I, yeah, I'd like to know the answer to that as well. <laughs> well, right, but I yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I think things that people can link to their everyday life. So if you can, if you can meet people where they are to some extent, and then build on that, I think it's much easier than radically replacing everything. But sometimes you can look at like moments where people have changed what they do. So if someone goes on holiday, for example, and they, I don't know, they stay somewhere where they do something different because of some other con contextual thing. You know, I don't know, you, you work somewhere where they're, I don't know, you, you visit somewhere where the public transport is very good. And so you get used to it over the week. You think, oh yeah, this is easy, I can just do that. There's some probably that's almost like someone experiencing a possible future for themselves in a, a very boring as an example, yeah. but things like that where you you kind of just come to okay. So I, I know someone who moved somewhere with solar panels on the roof, like photovoltaic cells, and she'd never really thought about that before. I don't think as a thing, maybe she had, but but like once it's there as a default thing, you you it becomes seems more possible. Now, once you've lived with that for a while, you think, well, yeah, maybe the next place I live will have that as well. Or I, just, I know it's obvious, but it's like these things where you can kind of already see that you're perhaps perhaps already acting in a in the same way you might do in the future, and build on that and expand from from there. Maybe I don't know. I mean, that's kind of I suppose that is a well-known theory in transition, like maybe in transition governance, perhaps anyway, like the idea of, of that. But I, yeah, um, I don't know. It's not really an answer, but partial answer. Good question, thanks. Okay, any other questions, comments on John? Okay, I have a one question. Oh, oh Amela. Just follow up, I was thinking when I'm asking and you, you're answering, I was thinking, okay, maybe sometimes you can't move, but if you have virtual reality or technology uh, helping you to experience how it would be to do whatever mm. choice, uh, we, we think is reasonable to do. Maybe this would be also helping. And then you start thinking, okay, but virtual real reality, artificial intelligence also use energy and everything, you know, <laughs> what is the, yeah. the, the solution. But maybe we should also think about yeah, what technology can, how it can help us yeah. to really experience these futures. Yeah, I think if it's done well, I think it could do. I mean, I, I worry a bit about it being kind of well, I don't know. No, I mean, I think, yeah, if it's done, uh, yeah. It depends whose vision it is, I think. Yeah. I, I think if, if it's a Mark Zuckerberg metaverse vision of a future, you know, and everyone, like, I think that possibly is not, like, that's sort of centrally determined in a way that maybe is not 
so bottom up, but I don't know how you would create the thing, yeah, that's yeah. more, that's both gives you an experience of a different future, but also is not someone else's vision of a different future. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But, but yeah, it's good, good, good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Tobias? It was just basically a comment, and I, I thought that it was very interesting to look at kind of engagement and thinking in a conversation as a way, as kind of a way to, to move forward, and that is a kind of end goal as well. It was very interesting to look at that. A conversation. conversation. Yeah, look at kind yeah. of uh, engaging in a conversation and, and starting that and kind of yeah. how are you going to do that? With, with, with who, though? Who would you? Yeah, it, okay. it's very interesting to see who you want to, to engage in a conversation, who you'd like to, to involve and how, how you do that, because it's not, uh, not yeah. so easy. I guess it's true. It may be joining conversations that are already going on, but just we're not aware of them, or people are, some people are not aware of them, I think. I mean, yeah, it's a good... I mean, maybe it's a continuous thing as well. I mean, maybe all of transition is, if you see transition as being an ongoing process, maybe it is just an ongoing conversation forever. That's the whole point, perhaps. It's not a, you know, it's not a thing that's done at some point. It's a, yeah, it's a continuous, perhaps, negotiation, maybe. Yeah. But, okay, thanks, Sid. Okay, thanks. Any other? Okay, just, I have just one. Um, I suppose that you're mostly like a teacher and work with the students and student projects and stuff like that. And I'm curious if you actually have any collaboration with, uh, for example, local governments or something that, for example, at local governments are say, oh, that's cool, these methods you use. Let's use it, for example, I don't know, defining some strategy for fighting climate change. So yeah, I mean, that would be good. I, I mean, it's, I haven't been very successful at doing that. I've done it a little bit, but I think it probably needs... I think, like, yeah, I haven't been as good at doing it as I should say, basically. But I think sometimes it needs good demonstrators. So I would say once there are more projects that do this well, then you can show them to other local government and say, well, look what they're doing. Perhaps we could follow a similar process. And I think the thing that, just thinking back to one that didn't really work very well, um, was I think that, you know, coming and saying, well, we're design researchers, we're going to do this, I think was... They sort of assumed we were re going to redesign their website for them, which would have been actually quite useful. But that wasn't the point of the project. And I think, like, I, yeah, I think it needs more. In, it needs more skills <laughs> engaging with with local government than perhaps I have. I think I would say. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of my aspirations to do it better. But um, thanks. Uh, any other? Okay, I just want. Practical, this is just a practical question. Can you just sum up uh, what will be your workshop about tomorrow? Yeah, okay, okay so, so the, the workshop is, yeah, okay, so the workshop's going to be, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I've, I'm still, there's a couple of bits that are, that are flexible at present that I'm thinking, seeing, learning from some stuff today, I'm going to try and modify them a bit, but. Um, oh, hi, hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, this is the next. It's just sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, but yeah, so the workshop's gonna, um, I mean, we're gonna, one of the things will be using those new metaphors cards that I showed, but in a way to try to look at metaphors for different futures, generate some new metaphors and think through what, what that might mean and what we might do practically with it around, around transitions in different, in different topics. So if you've got something you're working on, that might be an interesting thing to apply it to, or we'll have some kind of other examples that we can work on. So there'll be a bit, a bit around metaphors, going to do a bit around um, this idea of like hauntology that I mentioned, which you know, it could be about ghosts and hauntings, but it's not really. It's more about ideas that perhaps haunt society. Um, and so we'll do a, we're going to do an exercise around that, which, which hopefully will be interesting. And, um, and something else as well, which I'm going to decide based on <laughs> some of the other talks, I think. But yeah, so hopefully it'll be quite fun and practical and you, know, you end up with some ideas from it as well and maybe some methods as well that you could use. Okay, thank you. If there are any more questions, then I will say thank you, Dan. Yes, thank you. And I think you can catch Dan afterwards at the coffee break or somewhere and have a chat.